This week we're looking at foreign currency and it's an important week this week. Um, the work itself and the detail of what we're going through isn't, I mean we're not going to say it's easy but it's not amazingly difficult, but what it is is a really good stepping stone into next week when we look at hedging. And so to be able to do hedging effectively and know the accounting and sort of work through the accounting for hedging effectively, understanding what we're doing today is important. So it is an important stepping stone for next week. Um, and then, oh, and then we move into leasing um, and cash flows and like tax and cash flows. So you know there's a few few things to think about as we come up. Uh, what we're looking at today. So what we're going to be having a look at is foreign currency. Now, I'd imagine. Look, I mean, Australians do travel an awful lot. Um, you know, Australians do travel an awful lot. Obviously, you know, a lot of, you know, quite a number of people have traveled here to study. So, I mean, we, we do understand, and I'd imagine pretty much every one of you understand the issues that surround foreign currency because foreign currencies change the rates, the foreign currency exchange rates move. If foreign currency exchange rates didn't move, all we'd have to do is have sort of a, some sort of adjustment value, just put into a spreadsheet, adjust it across, and then we'd have everything in one exchange rate and we just add it all together and life would be easy. But because foreign exchange rates move, that creates issues for us. Because we may have borrowed money at a certain point in time, and we, still, we might still owe that, five, say we borrowed $500,000 US, or a company's borrowed $500,000 US. And if that was done when the Aussie dollar, US dollar exchange rate was at a certain point in time, the, va the Aussie dollar value of that will be a certain amount. And then if that, that exchange rate changes, the Aussie dollars that you owe will be different. Even though the amount of US that you owe will be the same, the Aussie amount will be different. And I suppose the issue is how we deal with that. So there are two aspects of what we're gonna be looking at today. One is around transactions overseas. So that's buying and selling things overseas, that is borrowing money from overseas, that is lending money overseas. It's those sort of transactions where you're in a, say an Australian company just dealing with some sort of overseas situation. The other thing that we're going to be looking at is when you might have a foreign subsidiary and that foreign subsidiary has their accounts denominated in something other than the currency that you're dealing in. So if you're an Australian company presenting in Australian dollars, you might have a foreign subsidiary in New Zealand and they're presenting in New Zealand dollars. You can't just add those two things together when, you, when you're setting out the consolidation and when you bring those two things into the consolidated account. So you need to make some sort of adjustment for that. And that's what we're going to be looking at in the second part. So how to deal with, in an accounting sense, the effect that changes in foreign currency rates have on the business. So if you're an Australian company, you might owe money overseas and the foreign currency rate moves. If you have property overseas and the foreign currency rate moves, or if you have an overseas, overseas subsidiary, there's issues that we need to deal with in all of those. Before we get into why it's an issue, given that we've had some time off, and I know, well, it's been, what, three weeks since I've seen, actually, I would say a number of you, and I understand from a rational point of view why, why some of you weren't here. But three weeks since our last class together, it's been kind of two weeks since the exam. We might have, you know, in the sort of two long, two long weekend periods, it's probably a good idea just to refresh on what the point of actually being here is, apart from just having to weather the storm and get on with it and say goodbye to the subject at the end, is to be able to look at an issue that's happening and from an accounting point of view, see what that, that issue is also how to interpret accounting regulation, and that's what we do all the way through. So some of that is dealing with actual numbers. Some of that is actually getting to calculate construction contract figures. Some of it may be to determine providing advice to a client, um, and also to apply that regulation. So when is an issue an issue? And it's an issue when it's economically important. Like, if it didn't affect anyone, if there was very few dollars involved, we wouldn't care. Um, no one, like, the regulators wouldn't care, practice wouldn't care, we wouldn't care. It would just be one of those things that's kind of happened and we just walk away from it and it doesn't make a difference. But as soon as it starts to become an economically important issue, as soon as there are real kind of large dollars involved, that makes it an issue. And if you can consider foreign currency, if you can consider the amount of global trade that's happening, it is absolutely an issue. So, I mean, it is something that from, from what we're doing today, it is an issue. 
when you consider next week when we look at derivatives, and that's and we'll be looking at how to account for derivatives, how to account for foreign, how to account for a little bit more complex financial instruments. There's trillions of dollars of these things. These things, there are lots of them. Now, even if there's lots of them, it doesn't make a difference if there aren't alternative ways to account for it. So if there's just a way to do it, then we just go, this is the way you do it, and we walk away from it. But when there are choices that need to be made between different ways of doing it, suddenly that starts to cause problems because thinking back to what we talked about in week one, there are incentives there for how management will report information. Now, it's not to say just because the incentives there, management will always do this. I mean, by and large, most of them will just do things the way that need to be done. But there are incentives on the margins and people will take advantage of that. So are there alternative ways of doing things? And when do these differences actually affect the financial statements? So one of the issues we'll look at in two weeks' time is around lease accounting. If you have certain types of leases and you can get them off balance sheet, that will drastically change how your company looks. And that is an issue that the regulators see as quite important. So if it changes it, will companies make choices to make your, make your statements look in a certain way? So those are things that to consider when you look at an accounting issue. If, if people care about it, if it is going to affect bottom lines, if it affects the bottom line, if there's money involved, someone cares about it. Now, with foreign currencies, what we've got here, now you've probably, yeah, so in the last four or five years, lots of people have been traveling, well, actually, even going back a little bit longer than that, it's been really awesome traveling to the US. I don't know if anyone has done much traveling to the US in the last four or five years. But I mean, it's just been really good because it's just cheap. Um, I mean, the US is cheap. I mean, Australia is an expensive place. I mean, I don't think I've bought clothes in Australia for a long period of time because it's just massively overpriced. Pretty much every time we go to the US, we'll, it's not generally me that needs all the suitcase, suitcase room, but generally we'll take spare suitcases with us because you just go shopping. It is really cheap. Plus, the exchange rate has been really good. It's up, been up close to parity, or better than parity. And look, we've dropped down a little bit, but it's still pretty solid. But what you'll notice is this period of time, just in the middle, sort of 2008, that was around about August 2008. And you saw a massive drop in value in the Aussie dollar versus the US dollar. Or it could have been that the US dollar just increased quite dramatically against the Aussie dollar, but I think it was the Aussie dollar crashing. Now, I was in the US actually just before that happened because I was there for a conference in Chicago in July 2008. And you could see it in my credit card statement when I got back home. It was kind of, I was getting about 90.91 towards the end of the trip, it was about 88. And literally 10 days after I got back, we were down in the 60s. Now, why that becomes important, and it wasn't for me because I didn't have any outstanding debts in relation to the, in relation to the US. But if you're a company that has borrowed US dollars, if you're an Australian company who's borrowed US dollars at near or close to parity, say you borrowed $500,000, or say you borrowed a million dollars around about here, that's about 95. So that would be probably, what, 1.1-ish million dollars Australian that would, that would be equivalent to. Within the space of two weeks, that one, point, that one million dollars US would be the equivalent of about 1.7, 1.8 million dollars US. So suddenly you owe the same amount of US dollars, but you owe a huge amount more in terms of Aussie dollars. The question is, how do you reflect? Well, I suppose the first question is, should, not even should you, it's a question to you guys. If you're a user of financial statements, is that information useful for you? How those sort of things move? Would you like to know that, be aware that the fact that they've got these exposures to foreign currencies and this has happened to them? Yeah. I reckon so. I mean, I'd like to know if you've got, there's a risk there because that's what's happened. There's a foreign currency risk and it is up, just dropped down. The value of the dollar has dropped dramatically and that means you owe a huge amount more. That's an issue. Um, now, if you borrowed over the long term, that may not necessarily be a problem going forward. But if you've just borrowed, if you've bought a whole lot of stuff on 90 day terms from the US, you've got to pay that back within three months and you have to pay a fair bit more than what actually happened. So 
it is an issue. On a personal level, we also recognize this. Now, I don't imagine anyone's going traveling in the next six weeks, two months, because you know, you've got uni, you've got exams coming up. You know, come the winter holidays, people might start traveling. I mean, even, I mean, if you like going to the snow in New Zealand, there's obviously snow starting to fall, the snow in New Zealand. Towards the end of the year, obviously, you know, summertime might sort of get away a little bit longer. From a personal point of view, foreign currency risk actually, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story, that actually happened to me start of this, well, midway through last year and sort of into the start of this year. Because we, we, haven't, we haven't been away to the snow for a while, so we went, Evie was now old enough, she turned four in February, so we went, well, you know, get her on the snow early, sort of get her out there and, and see if she enjoys it. Good thing too, because she does. Um, so I booked a trip to Japan for February this year. So I got back the Monday of semester starting, but I booked and paid a deposit, I think it was around about this time last year. So I put down a certain amount of money with the deposit due whenever it happened to be, and, or with the remainder due whenever it happened to be. Now in that, they said, this is how much the remainder is and you have till whatever point in time to pay it. But also be aware that if foreign exchange rates move between the Aussie dollar and Japanese yen between now when you pay that deposit and when we've given you this advice and when you actually finalize that payment, the amount that we've told you that you owe may change. So, I mean, Aussie, obviously if the Aussie drops against the Japanese yen, you'll owe a lot more because they're paying local suppliers for things. Um, and so that is a risk that I have. There's a foreign currency risk I was then open to because of the fact that I hadn't paid that off. Now, one of the components that wasn't included in that was ski school. Now, I don't really ski, so I couldn't really teach her, and I don't think I'd want to teach her. It was actually kind of getting up there so I could get a bit of time on the snow myself, so you pay for ski school. The interesting thing about ski school, and this is also an opportunity to show a gratuitous shot, um, so that, that is Evie going to, going to ski school. Um, it's amazing how quickly they pick up skiing when they're little, um, and it was, it was a lot of fun doing that. But the interesting thing from an accounting point of view was that even though I gave them the credit card details about four or five days before we actually, before she went on this, and went and did this, they would only, uh, only charge the credit card and actually bill it a month later, which I thought was kind of weird, but that's what they did. They also advised that they would be billing it in Japanese yen and that any risk in terms of foreign exchange rates between when I paid, when I sort of said, this is what we're gonna do and when, they, when we finally paid would be borne by me. So, I was actually really concerned for the next three or four weeks that the Aussie dollar was going to crash against the Japanese yen because then I'd be on the hook for this set amount of Japanese yen would be a lot larger in terms of Aussie dollars. So again, I was bearing foreign exchange risk between when we signed up and when it actually happened. Now the types of risk, there's a foreign exchange risk in both those situations and we're going to explore this a little bit more next week. But what is interesting is in this particular situation, the service has been provided before the payment went through. So there's not like I can say we'd never, that never happened. Something has happened in that case. I do have a present obligation because there has been a past event. There is, in, there is something to consider there. With the money that I put down on the deposit, yeah, I have the rest that is open. I have that remaining amount that I have to pay for the rest of the trip but there is no onus on me to actually pay the rest of it. If I, walk away from, if I walk away from that and say, look, I don't want to go on that trip, I lose my deposit, sure, but I don't have to pay anything else. So I do have a risk because if I do want to go through it, if I have an intention to follow through on it, I do have to pay that and I am open to that risk and I'm exposed to that risk. But you could argue, is there really a present obligation in relation to the remaining amount? And that is important when we get to how we deal with the hedging situation if, and I didn't hedge in either of these, and there is a way we can hedge this situation from, a, from almost an individual perspective. Um, we wouldn't be taking out derivatives, we wouldn't be taking out forward contracts on these sort of things because that's not worth it. But there, is, there are things we could do and we'll talk about that next week. But think about where the obligation is, when it happens and what those risks are because when we start dealing with the risk mitigation next week, we're looking at what things that we're open to. And you know, there's foreign exchange risk, there's interest rate risk, um, 
people have ski resorts, you can actually get derivatives in relation to the weather. You can actually hedge against bad weather because obviously, you know, if the snow conditions aren't good, ski resorts aren't going to perform all that well. Um, you know, if, the, if it's really sort of summery days, then, you know, ice cream sellers do well. So, I mean, it's, there are reasons that link performance of companies with conditions which are outside the scope of their control, and you can actually mitigate against that, which is what hedging is about.